to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus Christ said, Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. We welcome you today to the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study of the Gospel of Matthew today. If you don't have your Bible out and ready, we want you to take just a moment, go get your Bible, locate it, as we're going to look together in the Word of God to the greatest sermon that was ever preached by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by congregations of the Church of Christ and individual members. Those members of the Lord's Church would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly in your local area, whether it be a worship service on Sunday morning or maybe Sunday night, Bible study on Wednesday night. You will find people there who love God, who are concerned about souls, and who more than anything want to help people go to heaven. Friend, if you want to know more about the Lord's Church, the plan of salvation, why we do what we do as Christians, you'll find people in the Lord's Church there who'd be happy to sit down and discuss God's Word with you, to, give, to, to open the Bible and just simply see what God has to say on a variety of different subjects. And so we encourage you to check out the Lord's Church in your local area. Friend, we'd also like to help you here at the Gospel of Christ in your journey to know God and His Word better. We encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all of our material free of charge. We have over 500 lessons on both the Old and New Testament, wide variety of topical studies. Be good in your study of the Word of God to use. If you'd like to have a copy, of this series on the Gospel of Matthew or any of our series. Just log on to our website, fill out a free media request form. We'd be happy to mail you a DVD or CD or maybe even more convenient, you can request it as a digital download and receive that instantaneously. And friend, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app, also available in the respective Android and Apple stores. Great way to keep up with what we're doing, study our lessons, and then stay in the Word of God through your smartphone as well. And so again, we're just so happy that you've joined us for our study of the Gospel of Matthew. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, please be opening to Matthew chapters 5 through 7 as we're going to think about the Sermon on the Mount. Let's begin reading in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes. Jesus says these beautiful words in Matthew chapter 5 beginning in verse 1. And seeing the multitude, Jesus went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and being exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Some of the most beautiful most encouraging verses in all the scripture are found right here in what we know of as the be attitudes. These are attitudes that I need to have and that need to be a part of my life. And so when you think about the Sermon on the Mount, what's it all about? 
The Sermon on the Mount is kind of like the Constitution for the Lord's Kingdom. It is the, the, the guidelines and the principles that citizens of Christ's Kingdom live by and incorporate into their life each and every day. Well, what does the Sermon on the Mount teach us? First of all, it teaches us about Christian character. I, I've got to realize to be the type of person God wants me to be, I, I, I've got to have the right attitude. You know, so much of life is about your attitude. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. L listen to the type of people we ought to be. Blessed are those who mourn. We're not talking about going around and being sad and mopey all the time, but those who have the humility to mourn and recognize their own sinful state and turn to God. Those are the ones who are going to be comforted. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the merciful. Uh, oh, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. We've got this whole litany of attitudes that I've got to have and have got to be a part of my character if I'm going to be the type of Christian God wants me to be. There is a right way to live in the kingdom of Christ and Jesus identifies the attitudes that ought to be a part of my life and heart each and every day. And then friend, as you think about the Sermon on the Mount, not only do we hear about the Christian attitude that definitely ought to be a part of my attitude every day, but we also hear about the type of character. The Christian's character is identified in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 48. In this context, you've got how the, our righteousness ought to be exemplified, not for our glory, but to the glory of God. Listen to Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And friend, this righteousness, it's different than what the Jews were. The Jews were used to seeing these people who dressed in the right uh, garb, who, 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 who said the right words, who, who looked religious in every way, but their lives really weren't lived right. And Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. These are people who went halfway around the world to make a proselyte. Then Jesus said they made him twice as much a son of hell as themselves. They, they were good at saying, using the right words, having the right uh, prescription come out of their mouth were it, but yet they didn't live according to that. In Christ's kingdom, we not only say it, we try to live it to God's glory every day. We hear about righteousness as it relates to, to anger. We can't just go around being anger with everybody. We've got to be willing to forgive and to not hold grudges and to, to let that go so that it does become a part of our life. We hear about righteousness as it relates to self-control, a big thing that people need to hear today. Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30. Jesus said, You've heard that it was said of those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, Whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, Cut it off, cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Is, what's Jesus teaching here? Is Jesus trying to teach us self-mutilation? Cut off your hand, pluck out. Friend, that was the problem the Jews had. They, they heard the words, but they missed the whole point. Jesus is not trying to get people to mutilate themselves, themselves. Jesus is saying it's more than just the exterior. It's in the heart. Self-control begins in the heart. You may say to yourself, I've never committed adultery, but here you are in your mind full of adultery. Jesus said, in essence, you have. And so what you're trying to get at, it's the heart of the matter. Controlling yourself, purity of heart and purity of body. Their mind and their heart was far from God. Matthew chapter 7 
or excuse me, Matthew 15, 7 through 9, their heart was far from God. And so Jesus is trying to help them see you've got to get the heart right for everything else to be right, and you've got to learn to control yourself. Christian's righteousness relates to divorce. Matthew 5, look at what Jesus said in verse 31 and 32. Furthermore, it's been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality, fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who's divorced commits adultery. What makes citizens of the kingdom of Christ different? They realize the sanctity of the permanency and the value of marriage. God created man and one man, one woman for life. Genesis 2 verse 24. The exception, fornication, according to Matthew 5, 31 and 32, Matthew 19, 9, the innocent party has the right to divorce a spouse who commits fornication against them. But, but, but friend, God's plan is for man and woman to stay together, to help each other, to work through thick and thin. And that's what makes citizens of the kingdom of Christ unique. That's what makes us stand out. We have re righteousness as it relates to our speech. Jesus says, don't go around making all these oaths. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. You don't have to swear by the temple, swear by the hairs on your head, or swear by the gold in the temple. Jesus said, just say it and mean it. Be a people whose word actually means something. Righteousness relates to our retaliation. You know, when somebody wrongs me, I don't have to wrong them. Somebody wants to steal your, your outer coat, give them your inner garment too, as it were. Go, somebody pushes you to go one mile, go two. Don't retaliate, do good to others. And then of course it relates to our enemies. What makes citizens of the kingdom of Christ different in the righteousness? We do good unto all men. We love our enemies. We do good for them. We pray for them. Those who spitefully use us and, and persecute us, we want them to be converted. We love all, we may not love what they do. We may not approve of their lifestyle, but we love them because they're created in the image of God and we want the best for them spiritually and we would be willing to help them in every way. Then in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about Christian citizens of God's kingdom as it relates to their sincerity in serving God. The Jewish religion, and every Jew was aware of this, there were a lot of people in that religion who put on a big show. There were a lot of people in that religion who were looked up to by others as being more righteous and more holy and closer to God as it were. But Jesus says those people are just fakes. They're not in it for sincerity and serving God. They're in it for what they can get out of it. Listen to what Jesus said about our sincerity in giving, in praying, and in fasting. Look in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Jesus says, Take heed, beware, that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Jesus said that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. And then he goes on to tell us how to pray. Talks about fasting. When you fast, don't put on a long face. Don't stand out there for everybody to see you, but do it privately between you and God. What's Jesus trying to get at in this whole section? In Matthew 6, verses 1 through 18, it's all about our motive. It's about our sincerity being between us and God, not for show. You know, there's a lot today in the religious world that's still about show. So much emotionalism in it, so much where people want other people to see. I promise, if, if there wasn't a crowd, half the time people wouldn't do the things they do. What is it when it's just me and God? 
Jesus says to those giving, when you do your, when you go out and you help the needy and you help the poor, don't stop and look around and make sure everybody's watching and make a big show out of it. If you do that, you're going to have your reward. Those who see you will praise you, but not God. Do it, do it between you and God. The person may know, God may know, and you may know. That's all that really matters. When you're praying, you don't have to stand up there and act like you're the next best thing to Jesus Christ and, and, and say all these big words, and do all this for show, and wave your hands. No. Jesus says, you want to do it right. When you pray, go, go into your inner room, shut the door, pray between you and God. It's not a big show. Fasting, Ah, oh, the Jews, they got so worked up about this idea of fasting. They would ask Jesus on multiple occasions. There were these great mourners you could hire. There was this big process. Oh, look how sad they are. And Jesus says that's not what it's all about. So much of the religion of the Jews had become about show to them, about who could outperform who and, and who could do it the best. And Jesus said, that's not real. That, that's fake. They're hypocrites. They're not doing that right. Well, friend, what about me and you? Why do we do what we do? Why, why, why give? Why pray? Why, why, why we take the Lord? Why we do all this? Is it so we can look around and say, wow, everybody saw that and they sure thought, no. Our worship, the things we do, the good deeds we do as a Christian, friend, that brings honor to God. It may help others, but I don't have to go around and ring a bell when I do that. I don't have to make sure everybody's watching, to tout my own good works, boast it on Facebook. No, that's not what it's all about. Between me and God. And that's what really matters. Am I doing it for the right reason? Am I sincere in motive in why I do that? And then in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34, we hear about our priorities. Jesus will talk about four ways that our priorities are extremely unique. The Christian's priorities are unique as it relates to his treasures. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Do not lay up for your trails treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Our treasures are not here because everything on this earth is one day going to be burned up with a fervent heat. 2 Peter 3 verses uh, 9 following. Our treasure, what we deem valuable, has got to be on the other side. Then Jesus talks about our priority in our vision. Listen to what he says. This is a really unique verse. Matthew chapter 6, this is what Jesus says. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that? What are you focusing on? What's your priority in your focus in this life? If, if, if your eye's bad, everything's dark. If your eye's good, you can see good. What kind of light are you bringing in? What are you focusing on? What's your priority in your vision? in this life, in your focus? Are we focused on the good things, the good light, Jesus Christ, walking down the road that we ought to walk and ultimately going to heaven? And then you've got priority in your devotion. Listen to Matthew chapter 6, verse number 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What's your priority in your devotion? Do you have a divided allegiance? Do you have as we might say, one foot in the world, one foot in the church? Are you trying to have your cake and eat it the best of both? Our devotion has to be solely to God. Does that mean I can't enjoy the things of this life or have a good life? Or have, That's not what we're saying. God has got to be priority number one. And Jesus mentions that even further as he talks about priority and anxiety. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, Jesus will say, Do not worry about the things of this life. And he'll go on to tell us why. Look at the birds of the air. 
They don't toil or sow or do any of that. They don't have to go out and work with their food. God takes care of them. Look at Solomon and all his glory. You're arrayed more than that. Your glory is greater than that. God's trying to get us to see that if we put first, if our priority is to seek first the kingdom of God, God's going to take care of the rest. Food is, listen to these words. This is the point Jesus is trying to get me and you to understand. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Friend, I want you to think about how much time we spend on the physical things. Food, shelter, clothing, making sure all... Jesus says, let me tell you something. You seek first my kingdom, all these things will be provided for you. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of its own thing. Sufficient for the day is the trouble they're in. Stay focused on what you need to do today. Seek first the kingdom. God's going to take care of us. I love the words of Psalm 37, 25. David said, I was young and now I'm old. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Now, that doesn't mean you can just sit around and be lazy. Paul talked about that in the books of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. I've got to work. I've got to do what God tells me to do. But if I'm mainly focused on the priority of God and His kingdom, God's going to take care of His own. I don't have to get all worked up in a knot and all worried about that. God's going to take care of His children. And then, my friend, as we think about citizens in the kingdom of the Lord, these citizens stand out as unique because they have a righteous judgment. Listen to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. And most people end it right there. But what's the rest of that verse say? What's the context say? For with the judgment you judge, you'll be judged. With the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove that speck or that splinter from your eye and look, a plank is in your own. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Is Jesus saying all, all judging or moral things is sinful? Of course not. John chapter 7 commands us, Judge with righteous judgment. John 7 uh, teaches us that. Now, hypocritical judgment. That's what's being talked about here. L let's illustrate. You've got a splinter. You go up to somebody who's got a splinter, little splinter coming out of their eye, and you walk up to them with a two-by-four coming out of your eye, and you say, let me help you get that little splinter out. Well, how in the world's that look? Well, you'd look at that fellow and say, you better go get some help first with that two-by-four, right? Well, that's the idea. Look at 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Paul said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to others, I myself should be condemned or, or, or unjustified. And so I, wanna, I, wanna look to, I don't want to do hypocritical judging, but righteous judgment is commanded by Almighty God. And then in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 27, we see the Christian's commitment. Commitment to a right way and a wrong way. There is a, a, a broad way that leads to destruction. Many are going down it. There is a narrow or restricted way that leads to eternal life. Few there are who find it. What way am I committed to? God's way, the right way, or the way of the world and the way of the devil? There are, listen. There are only two paths. You've got to make the choice. I've got to make the choice. What am I going to commit to? Are we committed to true teaching and true teachers? There are many wolves out there in sheep's clothing who look good and smell good, but inwardly they're full of dead men's bones. They're rot and filth and death. Are we going to commit to true teaching? Are we going to commit to say and actually be what we ought to be. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus said, It's not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. And then are we committed to hearing and doing? Not just hearing the Word of God. Some were, had heard it, but they weren't putting that into practice. And so as you think about the Sermon on the Mount, as we said, this is kind of a, 
a constitution for living in the kingdom of Christ. It tells us what the true citizens of the kingdom are going to be as it relates to my attitude. Do I have the attitudes God wants me to have as it relates to righteousness? Am I trying to live the way God wants me to according to His way, the right way, as it relates to my motive and my sincerity? Am I just doing it for show or am I doing it the way God wants me to do for the right reasons as it relates to my priorities? Is the kingdom of God the most important thing above all else in my life? Am I seeking first the kingdom? Am I making judgments based on the Word of God by first letting that Word pierce my heart and then trying to help others as well? And then am I committed? Am I committed to God's way and doing what the Scripture says no matter what the challenges may be? Friend, if you're not a child of God, we want you to know this today. We want you to know that the God of heaven loves you deeply. God wants you. To, God wants all men. To be saved. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, He doesn't want anybody to perish but all to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 verse 9, We want you to know today that God loves you. We love you. We want to help you. If you're not a child of God more than anything in the world, we'd love to help you obey the gospel. You may be thinking, what do you mean by obey the gospel? Well, friend, have you heard that message of Jesus as the Savior of the world, that He is the way, the truth, and the life? John 14, 6. Are you willing to commit to that in true faith and belief in Jesus? Unless you believe that I'm He, Jesus said, you'll die in your sins. Would you make the good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, and to have every sin washed away? Would you be immersed into Christ? The Bible says, Jesus speaking in John 3, verse 5 says, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel, you'd like to know more about the plan of salvation, we'd love to help you and we encourage you to join us next time as we're going to think more about the powerful gospel of Matthew. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.